right now. Good evening. I'm Brandon Fess with the Local History and Genealogy Division at the Rochester Public Library. Thank you for joining us, us this evening for A Modern Necessity, Feminism, Popular Culture, and American Womanhood, 1920 to 1948. For those of you who've been attending our programs all along in this series, spotlighting the centennial of women's suffrage, you'll notice that we've been following a historical path, starting with Native American women, going through the 19th century, up to the time of the 19th Amendment itself. Now that we're past election day, we're going to have a couple of programs to round out this series that talk about the legacy of the women's suffrage movement. In putting together a series, we decided to invite the deputy city historian and my supervisor, Michelle Finn, to speak on her work, which looks at American feminism in the wake of the suffrage movement. Michelle Finn is the deputy historian for the city of Rochester and senior historical researcher for the Rochester Public Library where she supervises the local history and genealogy division and manages the Rochester Voices Digital Humanities Project. Dr. Finn earned her degree in American history and a graduate certificate in gender and women's studies from the University of Rochester. She won the 2012 Susan B. Anthony Dissertation Award for her study on feminism and popular culture in the post-suffrage era and published a chapter from this work in The Ages of Wonder Woman, Essays on the Amazon Princess in Changing Times, 2013. A native Rochesterian, Dr. Finn finds her career as a public historian in her hometown extremely rewarding and welcomes the opportunity to share her scholarship with the library's audience. Without further ado, Michelle Finn. Thanks, Brandon. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in tonight. Um, you're all going to think I coerced Brandon into inviting me. Um, that's not the case, but um, anyway. Uh, so as you mentioned in setting this up, uh, this focuses on sort of the post-suffrage story. Um, you know, 2020 marks the 100th anniversary, as we all know, of the 19th Amendment, which acknowledged American women's right to vote. Um, and commemoration of this historic achievement has prompted a lot of examination, both celebratory and critical, of the decades-long women's suffrage movement, illuminating an important chapter in the history of American women. But today, I'd like to turn our attention to the subsequent story and ask the question, what happened after the woman suffrage movement once women won their fight for an amendment to the United States Constitution in 1920? Specifically, I want to know what happened to feminism in this country in the years following the passage of the 19th Amendment. I hope it's safe to assume by your presence at this talk that you too are interested in this question. So when historians first started asking this question, they came to a rather dismal conclusion, noting a relative calm in women's rights activism in the post-suffrage years, compared especially to the storm of activity that had preceded it, they declared that feminism had subsided in the wake of the 19th Amendment. They enlisted the metaphor of waves to describe what they found to be an ebb and flow in feminist activity which they measured by the intensity of women's organized push for rights and equality. Under this metaphor, the suffrage movement had been part of America's first wave of feminism. Its second wave came with the resurgence of women's rights activism in the 1960s and 1970s. And in between these crests, a disconcerting trough in which American women supposedly set feminism aside for social freedoms, consumerism, heterosocial harmony, and integration into male-dominated institutions. But did feminism truly disappear after women won the vote? Did it actually lay dormant throughout the middle decades of the 20th century? And if so, what connects the second wave to the first? Scholars weren't wrong in noting a splinter in the women's rights movement after winning the vote. Suffrage had been a singular unifying goal, and once it was achieved, women activists turned their attention to divergent and sometimes even conflicting agendas. A surge in conservatism after the First World War, compounded by an economic crisis and a Second World War, left many Americans more concerned about getting by and making do than pushing for widespread political reform, especially compared to the opening decades of the 20th century. 
However, in using women's organized activism as the sole metric for assessing the fate of feminism in the post suffrage years, these scholars miss an important part of the picture. One might argue that although an examination of women's activism before and after the 19th Amendment is a valid historical endeavor, to better understand the fate of feminism in the post suffrage period, we might be better served measuring cultural rather than overtly political activity. So by culture here, I'm referring to the way people understand themselves and their experiences and how they communicate this understanding to each other. Um, on the screen, you've got a very fancy definition by a very fancy man to basically say that same idea um, that Basically, culture is how people make meaning out of the world around them and share that meaning with each other. So to see how post suffrage Americans engaged with feminism, it's important to consider how feminism factored into their cultural understanding of who women were, what they could do and how they should be treated. In particular, the rise and importance of popular culture in the first half of the 20th century suggests that it is a great place to explore what Americans were thinking about womanhood in this period. After all, to be successful, popular culture must appeal to a wide audience or at least be widely recognizable. Pop cultural images of women, therefore, must reflect the characteristics of women that people expect and even want to see. And in our pop cultural view of American women in decades following the 19th Amendment, we find Interestingly enough, feminism, alive and well. So historians who argue that feminism subsided in the interwave period have focused on the ways in which popular culture appropriated feminist ideas of women's power and freedom only to reinforce restrictive roles as household consumers and desirable sex partners. Without completely discounting this interpretation, it's important to note that popular culture can simultaneously promote both oppressive and liberating messages. Thus, despite the negative effect historians have identified popular culture having had on feminism in the post suffrage period, we actually find a very compelling promotion of feminism there as well. Before jumping into some examples, let me back up and explain what I mean when I talk about feminism in this area in this era, rather. Um, as we know, feminism is a term that has been understood in different ways since it first appeared in the American lexicon in the 1910s. For our purposes today, I want to emphasize this historical emergence, for I'm applying the term as I understand women from that era to have used it. So a new term for Americans around 1913, Feminism involved a radical departure from the restrictive gender norms of the 19th century, which had largely confined women to a domestic identity limited by their family roles, social and political subservience, and economic dependency. Feminism called for an end to the sexual double standard and demanded women's complete political, economic, and social parity with men. Although the right to vote aligned with this goal, feminism extended beyond women's inclusion in the electoral process and called for more radical changes, like women's ability to support themselves through work outside of the home, to engage in sex without reproduction, and to freely pursue their own interests and talents, regardless of others' expectations and needs. In this way, early 20th century feminism was a modern set of ideas that emphasized individualism and self-determination. At the same time, it recognized the connection women had with one another based on their shared gender identity and the idea that any one woman's ability to live life on her own terms was intricately tied to every woman's ability to do so. So in a nutshell, early 20th century feminism sought to replace the 19th century version of womanhood with a modern alternative that was more independent, more self-assertive, freer, and more powerful. Now let's take a look at how this feminist perspective was represented and promoted within the popular culture of the post-suffrage years. So our first example might be a familiar one. 
uh, Mae West, who declared herself a kind of 20th century sex goddess in her 1959 autobiography, Goodness had nothing to do with it. Most people today know West from her 1930s film career and her reputation for feisty quips and double entendres dripping with sexual innuendo. And for those of you who are not familiar, I'm going to attempt to be fancy and switch over to give you a taste. See how this goes. It's a couple, about two minutes and 14 seconds. Um, it's kind of fun, so here we go. Well, when I'm good, I'm very good. But when I'm bad, I'm better. I see a man in your life. Not only one. I changed my mind. Does it work any better? Well, I'm caught between two evils. I generally like to take the one I never tried. Now, now take care of these men. Yes, give them all my address. Thank you. I am delighted I have heard so much about you. Yeah, but you can't prove it. Haven't you ever met a man that can make you happy? Sure. Lots of times. What kind of husband does you think I should get? Mm, I should take a single man, leave the husbands alone. Why, well, you know what to tell a lady when I see one. Yeah, what do you have to tell them? I had a shooter lion once. Really? Was he mad? Well, he wasn't exactly pleased about it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you were wonderful tonight. I'm always wonderful at mine. <laughs> Aren't you forgetting that you're married? I'm doing my best. What's a good of resistant temptation? I'll always be more. If I wish you'd forget your principles, Ruby, I must have you. Your golden hair, your fascinating eyes, an alluring smile, and lovely arms, your form divine. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Is this a proposal or you take an inventory? You certainly know the way to a man's heart. Mm -hmm. Funny, too, because I don't know how to cook. I'm sorry you think more of your diamonds than you do of your soul. I'm sorry you think more of my soul than you do of my diamonds. <laughs> do I bother you if I look over your shoulder? No, do I bother you? <laughs> I'll never forget you. No one ever does. Well, it's better to be looked over than overlooked. <laughs> Great town, St. Louis. You were born there? Yes. What part? Well, all of me. <laughs> what you do? Get your hair cut or have your ears moved down? You know I've been mad about you from the first time I laid eyes on you. Well, you're my whole world. What do you want to do? Drive me to a madhouse? Oh, I'll call you a taxi. Young lady, are you trying to show contempt for this court? No, I'm doing my best to hide. I wonder what kind of a woman you really are. Too bad, but I can't give out samples. I'll show up sometimes, too bad. All right, so, ah. There we are, Mae West, uh, always fun for a laugh. Uh, while this larger than life, hyper sexy persona became West's bread and butter, and actually to the point where in 1935, she was the second highest earning American in the country, uh, hot on the heels of um, Hearst, the publication giant. Um, so it was a pretty successful uh, brand for her. Um, but this trademark sexuality was more than just a ploy for ratings, it was a hallmark of her feminism. Along with her belief in a woman's right to live by her own rules without apology and her sense of solidarity with other women, or at least the ones who are not out to judge her. As her career unfolded, West became increasingly explicit in articulating these feminist beliefs, coming to see herself as a pop cultural feminist activist. Before West became a famous champion of liberated womanhood, she was an outgoing and energetic girl with aspirations for success on the American stage. A precocious child who grew up in a working class immigrant neighborhood in Brooklyn, West began her career as a young performer on vaudeville's amateur circuit, entertaining audiences with comedic acts modeled after flamboyant vaudeville personalities like the popular Eva Tangue. Encouraged by the favorable reception her sassy antics gathered from, garnered from audiences, West began incorporating erotic content into her acts, pushing the envelope of what early 20th century audiences 
and critics would tolerate. The overt sexuality that West brought to the provocative songs and dances she performed crossed the line for some critics, like Variety's Syme Silverman. Unless Miss West can tone down her stage presence in every way, she just as might well hop right out of vaudeville into burlesque, he chided in a 1916 review. And another critic in Detroit agreed after witnessing West perform a song called And Then, which provided a detailed play-by-play -play of the intimate ending of a date, he concluded that West was plainly vulgar. For such critics, West's explicit sexuality and crude behavior made her unfit for respectable audiences. Some theater managers went so far as to censor West's acts. In Boston, they turned the stage lights off so the audience couldn't see her perform her controversial shimmy dance, which was equated to a raunchy burlesque move involving a frenetic and provocative shaking of the shoulders, torso, and pelvis. While West appalled these more conservative critics, or blue noses as she called them, others thought she was great and encouraged her brazen performances. According to one account, men actually stood up and yelled for Mae West when she shimmied. Miss West simply shook the house from its seats, as well as shaking herself from her neck to her toes and then back again. West later recalled, my shimmy made headlines, so I had a hilarious skit called the shimmy trial in which I came before the judge for doing the naughty shimmy dance. As this skit reveals, West responded to her critics by doubling down and turning the criticism back on them, thumbing her nose at those who would judge her and mocking her detractors for being overly uptight. In doing so, she demonstrated more than a comedic performer's ability to laugh it off. She took a definitive stand against conventional standards of respectability, aligning herself with those who would defend the free expression of women's sexuality, <clears throat> feminists, West's defense of her shimmy and of other aspects of her stage and real life persona was in essence a defense of the modern feminist attitude promoting women's sexual freedom. For West, sex wasn't taboo, it was fun and funny. In contrast, traditional standards of femininity were stuffy and boring and they didn't get the reaction she craved from the audience. Identifying irreverent, unconventional behavior as both appealing and profitable, West rejected traditional limits to women's roles and conduct and embraced modern feminist ones. Although West was not necessarily motivated by a feminist agenda when she started out, as her career developed and she found herself continuously having to defend her views and behavior, her advocacy of modern feminist values became increasingly self-conscious and explicit. As she explained, I had a proper understanding which grew stronger that behind the symbol I was becoming, there was much material for drama, satire, and some kind of ironic comment on the wars of sexes and the internal engagement and grappling between men and women in a battle that never ends. My fight, she proclaimed in a 1934 interview, has been against depression, repression, and suppression. Rejecting the sexual double standard that required women to deny their sexual passion while men were free to pursue theirs, West wanted women to embrace their sexuality. As she saw it, the worst thing about the whole business of sex is the hypocrisy. Of all things, there's nothing sadder than a woman afraid of love. Love ain't no sin. When she took pen to hand to compose her own full length plays, novels, and movie scripts, starting in the 1920s and 30s, West's writing reflected this belief in women's sexual freedom and empowerment. The idea that a woman's sexuality did not have to be confined within traditional family roles and the idea that women like men should be in control of their own lives without being judged or having to cater to others' expectations. The success of West's career based in large part on these feminist messages suggests that American audiences were quite receptive to her ideas. Mae West was 50 years old when she left Hollywood in 1943. Having built a successful career on her image as a modern, sexually liberated woman, 
She not only survived the censorship crusade against her, but also outlasted the film industry's typical expiration date for a female sex icon. Not one for retirement, West continued to be an empowered sexual presence in American popular culture for the next 37 years, albeit on a smaller scale than she had been during her peak in Hollywood in the mid 1930s. Increasingly conscious of her role as a pop cultural feminist activist, West took a stand not only for her own right to express her sexuality as she saw fit, but for every woman's right to do so. In promoting women's sexual freedom and the move away from oppressive 19th century values, West carried the modern feminist agenda well into the post suffrage years. Similar to Mae West, we can see the persistence of feminism in the post suffrage period in B. Freeman, an African American performer also from the stages and screens of the 1920s and 1930s, albeit different stages and different screens. Freeman's image as a modern and sexually seductive character billed as the brown skin vamp led to her reputation among contemporaries as the sepia Mae West. A quick look at her performance as Dinah Jackson in the 1937 film Underworld reveals some similarities. Um, so I'm going to show you a clip. It's an Oscar Michaud film. Oscar Michaud was a widely respected author and independent filmmaker who created all black productions for predominantly black audiences in the early to mid 20th century. Um, unfortunately, the um, quality of Michaud's films on YouTube are not the best, but we will do our best. Um, and I tried to use the um, the closed captioning on YouTube. It totally butchered it. So I'm just gonna, the sound isn't great. I'll recap the, the main parts. It's just a short clip that starts. So um, the key points of that scene are um, that I think come across regardless of the quality of the recording. Um, the swagger, she has that similar Mae West swagger. Um, the one line that you might have missed was, who's that tall and handsome in the seat? So she's, she's clearly giving the gentleman who's getting his um, shoes polished the once over and, and those looks that um, sort of confident engagement with male characters um, really does resonate and reflect um, similarly as Mae West's characters did. So um, like West's sexually empowered heroines, Freeman's vamp characters were somewhat seedy, but nevertheless poised and powerful women who used their cunning and allure to get their way. Despite their ultimate function as the villain in the story, Freeman's vamps offered a version of womanhood that was intelligent, sophisticated, independent, and desirable. As similar as B. Freeman's vamps were to Mae West's divas, however, 
Differences in race and class led to significant differences in how they each functioned as feminist figures. As we saw, West's feminism lay in her promotion of women's sexual freedom and her flat out rejection of conventional standards of female respectability. Coming from a white working class background, West was relatively comfortable positioning herself against these traditional forces. As a middle class African American woman, however, Freeman largely embraced the ideas of respectability with which she was raised. Her feminism came into play in her work to elevate the status of Black women, in part by emphasize, emphasizing this respectability, presenting a dignified alternative to the debasing images that dominated mainstream culture. Consider, for example, Louise Beaver's Delilah in Imitation of Life or Hattie McDaniel's Mammy in Gone with the Wind. Uh, the role for which, of course, she won an Oscar in 1939, becoming the first African American actor to do so. Um, as highly acclaimed as Daniels and as McDaniel and Beavers were, uh, Hollywood limited them and others to roles as maids, servants, or slaves who happily worked for white people, reinforcing the idea that this was where Black women belonged. In contrast, Freeman's characters were independent operators, self-possessed women who controlled their own destinies. They were stylish and sophisticated and supported themselves financially. Freeman's vamps were never servants. They, the, they were the ones in charge. This was a decidedly more empowered image of black womanhood than that depicted by white America at the time. Freeman was conscious of the importance of these alternative images in the context of the films that she was in. As she explained, Oscar Michaud wanted to show the world that it didn't matter so much about your color if you lived in the civilized part of the world and you had certain standards of living. One was practically the same in one race as the other. In breaking from the Hollywood tradition that depicted blacks as ignorant and coarse, Oscar Michaud wanted to show African-Americans were a diverse and respectable group, just like whites. His films delivered a message of black competency, respectability and achievement that sought to elevate the status of African-Americans by marking them as middle class. As an actress in Michaud's films and in similarly race conscious stage productions in the 1920s and 30s, Freeman was an integral part of this cultural project. Freeman and Michaud were not alone in their effort to improve conditions for African Americans by overturning the racist stereotypes that reinforced their oppression. This was a primary goal among black leaders and race reformers in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. It was also a predominant theme within the Harlem Renaissance, the cultural movement created by a group of black artists and intellectuals centered in New York City in the 1920s and 30s. Before appearing as a vamp in Michaud's Silver Screens, Freeman sang, danced, and acted in theatrical productions that were part of this cultural movement. Designed to counter racist traditions like minstrelsy and blackface, these stage productions emphasized Black talent and artistry and were performed for integrated audiences, providing Blacks and whites alike a positive, uplifting view of African American social and cultural identity. Recognized as a seductive beauty, and in this image, um, I'm pretty sure Freeman is the one right in the center of the screen. Um, uh, so she was described um, as having eyes that thrill and a figure that's 40. Not quite sure what that means, but some 1920s slang. Uh, Freeman's physical allure vouched for the quality of black femininity within the context of these productions. Appearing on stage and camera in roles and costumes that showcased her talent and beauty, Freeman belied the notion that black women were unrefined drudges best suited to serving white families, thus distancing them from this historically oppressive identity. In refuting the mammy myth and its affirmation of black female servitude, however, Freeman's modern sexy image came dangerously close to reinforcing another, perhaps even more damaging stereotype, the promiscuous and sexually available Jezebel. 
historically used by whites to justify the objectification of black women's bodies, the Jezebel image portrayed black women as lustful and primitive, driven by sexual appetite and devoid of morality. As historian Deborah Gray White explains, while Mammy helped endorse the service of black women in white households, Jezebel excused their rape and physical exploitation. For those who intent on elevating black womanhood, both Mammy and Jezebel had to go. To this end, ambassadors of African-American womanhood or race women as they were known, typically conformed to traditional middle-class standards of female respectability. They dressed modestly, acted with reserve and limited their sexuality to reproduction within marriage. In putting her sexuality on display for paying audiences, Freeman veered considerably from this respectability formula. Yet rather than allow her sexy image to mark her as low class or disreputable, Freeman asserted her right to define herself as a sexual being while still maintaining her middle class status. And this was the second layer of Freeman's pop cultural feminist message. In addition to her efforts to elevate the status of black women with a modern image that counteracted historically oppressive ones, Freeman also insisted that female sexuality was compatible with middle class respectability in a way that more traditional race reformers did not typically allow. As reviews of her onstage performances and offstage persona, persona attest, Freeman was successful in reconciling these ostensibly opposing ideas about the desirability and respectability of black womanhood. Praised in prominent black run newspapers across the nation as a great stage favorite, Freeman was admired for her style and beauty and for possessing the trappings of a well-educated cultured upbringing. As one reporter noted, evidence of the culture of Massachusetts assails you the moment you greet her. Others commented on Freeman's high polished dialect and compared her speech, flawless as ever, to that of Oxford and Cambridge University students. Framing herself as middle class by emphasizing her education, upbringing, and dignified comportment, Freeman was a convincing representative of what critics hailed as, quote, a new group of young men and women entering the show world who are the products of the best schools and members of families that count. Refusing to accept images like Mammy and Jezebel as accurate representations of black womanhood, Freeman used her beauty and refinement to promote a decidedly different understanding. Combining seemingly contradictory ideas of what a woman should or could be, she found room for her sexuality alongside her respectability. Rather than allow it to mark her as base or vulgar, Freeman's sexy image was part of her racial uplift effort to empower Black women by positively reshaping their cultural identity. While it is unclear whether or not Freeman identified this as a feminist endeavor, she, like her contemporary Mae West, carried the vision for an updated and more liberated version of American womanhood into the post suffrage years. So while West and Freeman demonstrate feminism's relevance for adults in the post suffrage period, the fictional character Nancy Drew reveals the popularity of feminist messages among young people and particularly girls. First appearing on bookshelves in 1930, the Nancy Drew mystery stories quickly rose to prominence in the juvenile fiction industry maintaining popularity among young female readers throughout the remainder of the 20th century. The series title character, Nancy Drew, is a brave, intelligent, self-reliant, and determined teenage sleuth who handily solves mysterious crimes that baffle the male law enforcement professionals who are supposed to be in charge. As her lawyer father, Carson Drew, admits, as a detective, you have me backed completely off the map. In contrast to the frail, passive female type promoted in the 19th century, Nancy Drew was strong, assertive, daring, and confident. She was a leader and as independent as a teenage girl could hope to be. She also, as you see here, drove a very zippy sports car. 
As the response from young readers indicated, these qualities appealed to girls who did not wish to be constrained by traditional gender roles and identities. As one reader later explained, Nancy Drew rescued herself. Nancy Drew solved problems. Nancy Drew behaved the way a child of nine wants to believe she will behave as a teenager, sensibly, competently, independently. She traveled the world in pursuit of puzzles as if it were the most ordinary thing to do. She saved victims from drowning, escaped from car trunks and boats and planes. She was treated as an equal and an expert in a world of police chiefs and lawyers. Above all, she was blissfully self-confident. Nancy Drew was an alternative to the passive princesses. In the 1970s, so-called second wave feminists identified Nancy Drew as the feminist icon. Ms. Magazine hailed her as a role model for young feminists, and some women's rights leaders even suggested that the daring heroine helped launch the new women's liberation movement, as many of those leading the charge had read and been inspired by Nancy Drew when they were growing up. Bolder, more physically and mentally active, more interactive with boys and men, and more self-sufficient than the 19th century standard, Nancy Drew embodied many of the qualities that feminists, both early 20th century and second wave, considered liberating and empowering. Unlike Freeman and West, who were conscious of the progressive messages inherent in their work, Nancy Drew's creators never intended for her to challenge convention or promote women's power or freedom. Rather, the feminism we find in Nancy Drew was more circumstantial than purposeful. In fact, Nancy's creators flat out denied having had any feminist intentions for their character. I don't align her with the feminist movement at all, reported Mildred Wirt Benson, the, the original Carolyn Keene in 1993. That was never in my mind. Similarly, Harriet Stratemeyer Adams, whose family owned the syndicate that produced the Nancy Drew mystery stories, insisted in a 1980 interview, if I made Nancy liberated, I was unconscious of the fact. Lacking a feminist awareness of the character they designed, Nancy Drew's architects were primarily interested in her popularity an ability to appeal to what they identified as their target audience the so-called modern girl. After all, Nancy Drew was a commercial product. The character, her stories, their pseudonymous author, Carolyn Keene, all were the brain children of Edward Stratemeyer, a businessman and inspire, aspiring giant in the juvenile book industry at the turn of the 20th century. Around 1906, Stratemeyer founded the book syndicate through which he and his staff of ghost writers produced a high volume of children's serials for the juvenile market. Originating the titles, characters, plots, and chapter outlines for new stories, Stratemeyer hired writers at a per volume fee to develop his ideas into full length manuscripts. A rather ingenious book production factory, the Stratemeyer syndicate ultimately dominated the juvenile fiction market with such, with such series as The Rover Boys, The Bobsy Twins, The Hardy Boys, and many, many others. By far the most successful and prolific businessman in the children's book industry of his time, Edward Stratemeyer built a million dollar empire from the production of more than 800 literary works. As Oil Had Its Rockefeller compared Fortune Magazine in April, 1934, literature had its Stratemeyer. Captain of the juvenile book industry, Stratemeyer was a businessman ultimately concerned with his company's bottom line. He created stories and characters he knew would appeal to his young, predominantly white middle-class audience. When it came to creating Nancy Drew, Stratemeyer's instructions were to make the stories bright and vigorous. He eschewed wishy-washy fantasies in favor of fast paced stories about an energetic and determined heroine, noting in these days, the girls and women have about as much nerve as the boys and men. The timid weeping girl must be a thing of the past. Nancy Drew was Stratemeyer's version of the go ahead girl of today, an up to date American girl at her best. That Nancy Drew's creators were aiming for modern 
and inadvertently ended up with liberated, suggests the extent to which the feminist ideology shaped the understanding of what it meant to be a modern woman, or in this case, a modern girl in the post suffrage period. Contrary to the idea that feminism disappeared after women won the vote, Nancy Drew attests to its staying power. Feminist values had so effectively taken root in American culture that they were present even when there was no conscious effort to articulate them. In fact, at the end of the day, Nancy Drew was actually a pretty conservative figure. And what could be considered the opposite of a feminist intention, her creators were careful not to make her socially disruptive. While she embodied the energy, independence, and indomitable spirit of the modern girl, she also revealed the limitations of this image in her willingness to tow conventional race, class, and gender lines. For example, at the same time that Nancy could be daring and adventurous, she also had to be polite and endearing. Through ongoing correspondence between Harriet Stratemeyer Adams, who took over the syndicate when her father died in 1930, shortly after the first volumes were published. Um, so Harriet Stratemeyer Adams and Mildred Wirt Benson, we see these instructions. Um, so Benson, of course, being Carolyn Keene for, uh, throughout most of the series. Um, and Adams is spelling out what she wants to see in her letters to Benson, instructing her um, on how to make Nancy. And she says, will you stress that Nancy is sensible, level-headed, and very keen, but also sympathetic, kind-hearted, and lovable. Benson later noted, Adams was always reigning in the character this way. She asked that I make the sleuth less bold and that abrupt sentence endings be avoided. In editing, a simple Nancy said became Nancy said sweetly, she said kindly, and the like, all designed to produce a less abrasive, more caring type of character. In addition to being sweet, kind, and caring, Nancy was respectful and respectable. She put others' needs ahead of her own and was strangely shy about accepting praise for her work, not to mention the idea of actually being paid for it. Although she had a steady boyfriend, the 16-year-old remained chaste. At the end of the day, Nancy reinforced some pretty traditional ideas of how a proper young lady should behave. Not only did she conform to these traditional gender norms, Nancy Drew also reflected conservative attitudes about race and class. For one thing, it's never difficult to spot the villains in a Nancy Drew mystery story. They are invariably poor, unappreciative, disrespectful, and grasping. Nancy was always quick to distinguish between the deserving and the undeserving characters that she encountered. The deserving were those who knew their place and accepted the existing social hierarchies. The undeserving were those who sought to rise above their assigned station. Similarly, the racism embedded in Nancy's books was especially pernicious. Not only were Nancy, all of her friends, and every respectable character white, any dark complexioned characters were either servants or crooks, and the few black characters that appeared were some combination of uncivilized, irresponsible, immoral, and even inhuman. I believe the word vicious is actually used at one point to describe one of the black women in the stories. Um, the very stereotypes that B. Freeman was working against in her cultural, pop cultural feminist effort. So this blatant classism and racism of the Nancy Drew book certainly undermined their ability to liberate and empower girl readers, um, especially non-white, non-middle-class girl readers. Uh, the modern girl to which the series catered was American, white, middle-class, or could at least imagine herself as such. Although Nancy Drew was a modern girl, there were clearly limits to how far she actually pushed the boundaries of the traditional social order. These limits were set by the rich white man who created her and the daughters who carried forth his legacy. Yet it is these limits that make Nancy Drew such an interesting case study for feminism in the post-suffrage period. 
that we can find feminist messages in what was ultimately a conservative character designed by conservative people who had no intention of upending the social status quo suggests just how acceptable and mainstream these once radical ideas about women and girls had become. The early 20th century feminist movement had actually succeeded in shifting the parameters of acceptable femininity away from the 19th century standard of meekness, frailty, and confined domesticity towards physical and mental strength, independence, assertiveness, and the determination to pursue individual goals beyond traditional familial roles. So effectively had the feminist ideology taken root that it persisted even in the absence of a conscious intention to promote it. So as we've seen, feminism expressed by each of these examples was tied to their modernness. That is the extent to which they were modern figures that diverged from the restrictive 19th century model of womanhood. Moving away from the idea that feminism must involve a formally organized political or social movement, we see how pervasive feminist ideas were in the post suffrage period when we look at the ways they manifested within American popular culture and the average Americans understanding of what it meant to be a modern woman or girl. Although these pop cultural figures or the agents responsible for them did not always acknowledge the feminism inherent in their work, Mae West, B. Freeman, and Nancy Drew each shows how feminism resonated across a wide sample of the American public well into the post suffrage period. Thank you. So should I stop sharing my screen and open it up for questions? Oh, thanks. I see the clap. Thanks, Craig. <laughs> yes, thank you, Michelle, for, for your, excuse me. Thank you, Michelle, for your talk tonight. And yes, certainly stop sharing and we can start having a conversation. We haven't received any questions in the chat during the talk. Um, anyone like to jump in? Ah, we have a question right here. Oh, okay. That's a great question. Hang on, let me get this set up so I can see it better. Okay, so do you want me to read it? I can read it out. Okay. How was juvenile literature perceived by those opposed to feminism? Was there a backlash counterpart to Nancy Drew? Um, yes and no. Uh, Nancy Drew was extremely popular and I don't, I think the conservatism in, embedded in the character, if you've read the original books, she really is a proper young lady. Um, so it, it wasn't like she was perceived as wild and crazy running around and disrupting the social status quo. Um, but juvenile literature definitely had its critics, um, this sort of, um, you know, factory model of producing literature um, certainly the more uh, sort of highbrow um, interpretation of what literature should be. Um, and I, I believe even, I should know this better working in a library, um, but I do believe that um, libraries were uh, pretty against, I don't know if it was still um, the case when Nancy Drew appear, appeared on the scene in 1930, but um, at the beginning of the 20th century, there was certainly um, a, a train of thought within the library world that this, these books from Stratemeyer uh, were just trash and really didn't belong alongside other respectable books. As a librarian, I'll, I'll say that in the 1930s, there were conservative librarians around who still held those views. <clears throat> we have another question, this time from Anne. To what extent did feminism impact the portrayal of women characters in comic books? <laughs> and are you setting me up for this? Um, so my uh, fourth part of this that I cut out because this was already over 40 minutes long, uh, focused on Wonder Woman. Uh, let me just make sure I'm getting your actual question right before I go off on this Wonder Woman tangent. Um, yeah, okay. So. Wonder Woman, and I would encourage you to go to the chapter in uh, the book that I published, which is essentially my dissertation chapter, which is what I'm basing this off of. Um, and that book is called The Ages of Wonder Woman. Um, 
Marston, William Moulton Marston, who created uh, Wonder Woman, was a feminist. He um, tried, before he came to comic books, he was an academic psychologist. Um, he had this whole career in many different um, platforms. He tried to get his message across, um, kind of coming out of this progressive era idea that uh, a very essentialist idea about women's um, being naturally, intrinsically um, more peaceful, more loving, more carry caring. He called them love leaders. Um, and because women were so you know, generous and nurturing and supportive of others in this way, he thought that meant they would be better leaders than men politically. Um, and so this was his message from early 1900s. And finally, in 1940, 1941, he put pen to paper and um, created Wonder Woman. And that was very much her message. Um, and there's a lot to unpack in that character. But to answer your question, um, feminism very much impacted women in comic books um, in this period. Yay, thank you, Anne. You guys are really an awesome, I don't even want to say audience, group to be with. Great pals. Any other questions? Um, anyone who wants to talk Wonder Woman, yeah. feel free to reach out. Um, <laughs> I decided to leave it off the table today just because uh, it's, I don't know, I feel like I've talked about her a lot. Um, more supporting character, what can you, what do you mean in other comic books or in within Wonder Woman's comic books? Um, so I didn't look too much at comic books broadly, but yes, before Wonder Woman came on the scene, um, the you know the images of women in comic books were more the you know victim to be rescued by the male character uh the male hero rather um so she was definitely among i'm i'm not i don't consider myself enough of a comic book expert to say with 100 percent authority but if she was not the first super um woman character super female character uh, he, hero, she was among them. Um, there might have been some obscure, certainly as far as mainstream, mainstream widely consumed comics went, yes. You're welcome. What other questions do we have? It I, I got a question, Thomas. Um, sort of relating to that, I don't know if you've seen the movie Wonder Woman, but like Most when she like declares her love for the the male counterpart, should that be seen more so as like she's choosing to love this guy, or like her feminism and like her womanhood is dependent on on the love? Because I'm like torn between the two of those. That's a really great question and a really good point. Thanks for bringing it up, Thomas. Um, there's nothing contradictory about feminism and love. Um, women can be feminists and fall in love. So those, those two things um, are compatible. And just because a woman character is choosing to be in a relationship, um, it, you know, it depends on what else is going on around that relationship. Is it a, you know, dependency? Is it is it, or is she actively making this choice um, because it's following her heart and what she wants her life to be like? Um, so the idea that uh, you know feminist women have to be, you know, swear off love and <laughs> live you know solitary lives is is not the case. Um, another point to make in talking about the movie Wonder Woman and the comic book, Marston's original creation changed a lot over the years. So he died in 48, which um, you might have been wondering why my talk was from 1920 to 1948. Um, that's because that's 
when my study of feminism in this period ended based on that that sort of brought it up to an interesting era excuse me in um american history in this kind of post-world war ii something different is definitely taking place there that required a lot more unpacking um but yeah marston's death in 48 um the next people to take over the wonder woman character um not not as feminist as he was trying to be with her so the character has changed and um even it's interesting the the 70s television show which most of us many of us might be familiar with um if you watch first season is set in the 40s it is the original wonder woman and yes obviously they changed the character a lot um with linda carter and making her um television uh friendly but uh second season they just went off the rails they brought her into the modern era it, she's decidedly less feminist. They just strayed widely from the original character um, in the second season. It's just, it's a, it's a, it's a good one season show. Um, so. We have another question here from Martina Thompson. Were there other books that promoted feminism that are similar to the Nancy Drew series? Yes, um, for sure, for sure. I, so again, promoting feminism, it depends on what you mean, like consciously trying to promote feminism or expressing feminist identity because the character was modern and modern equaled these feminist qualities. Um, so any book that is really, uh, th this theory that I have is that you can hold it up against any book in this period. If, if they're positioning the character as modern, you will find what we now look and say, that's feminist, whether or not they were going for that. Um, that's sort of the crux of my argument. So offhand, I'm sorry, I'm really not thinking of any titles, but I can look into it and get back to you. We have another question, this time from Steve Ewan. What extent did the portrayal of women in Disney films evolve with women's movements? Was there any direct reaction or were they more focused on appeal to traditional values? I haven't studied Disney, so I'm sorry, I really don't know. Um, what extent did the portrayal of women in Disney films involved with the women's movements? I mean, popular culture is always going to reflect what's going on at the time. So feminism's there, it's a force in the world, it's going to factor in in one way or the other. Um, and it's, again, I'm not, not a Disney expert. Um, I wish Amy Pepe, my former colleague, were here because she could probably take it from here for me. Um, but uh, as far as I know, Disney is not a terribly um, progressive company, uh, though there's certainly many, again, this idea of many ways to read a feminist image. Um, so one person can look at, um, you know, Cinderella, and say, oh, you know, she's tied to the house, she's cleaning, she's sweeping, um, she's this weak victim. And others can look at her and say, no, like she, despite the rules and her place in life, she seizes what she wants with some magical help from a fairy godmother and uh, uh, makes most of it. I mean, a lot of these are based on like folklore. So these stories have been a long, around a long time. So the, the spin that Disney puts on his feet on their female characters um, is really, again, going to be an effort to, you know, kind of speak to the audience. Um, and you've got to have some of those qualities in there for any kind of modern girl to find that to be an appealing message. Can I ask a, a quick question? Hey, yeah, hi. <laughs> nice to see you again, Michelle. It's been a while. Very good to um, see you. Greetings from Texas. Uh, quick question. As you know, I'm, I'm deeply ignorant of most things 20th century, so uh, my apologies. We have a medievalist in our midst. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there weren't that many movies made in the Middle Ages, so I, didn't have to, I don't have to cover that too much. But um, 
So I apologize if this is sort of a dumb question, but in the period you're looking at, I guess primarily the 30s and 40s, were there particular genres that lent themselves to these more modern characters uh, than others? Like, I don't know, film noir or something. <laughs> I will be quiet and listen. No, that's great. Film noir was awesome. Um, certainly that idea of the vamp um, evolved into the femme fatale, um, that idea of, again, that's a perfect example for reading a message in two different ways. Um, so I, I don't know to answer your question about was there one medium that was more um, prone to these messages than another. I don't feel I can speak to that, but um, looking at certainly mass culture, so film um, and, and eventually television uh, would be those, would reach a wide highly receptive audience as did comic books. Um, the femme fatale image, you've got this classical idea of the sexually potent woman being a source of danger, right? And that was B. Freeman's vamp image as well. She was one of the villains, um, sometimes the, the main villain. Um, so this, on, on the one hand, that's a repressive message, right? Like you can't have sexually uninhibited inhibited women because they are a source of destruction. Um, however, flip it around and watching those images, nobody wants to be the boring girl sitting in the corner or that you know stuffy old lady that Mae West was the butt of the, you know, set Mae West up for her line of with the lion. Like everyone wants to be the 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 more active and um, per, the one in control. Um, so those are the more engaging characters. So if you read it that way, it is promoting those values. So um, yeah, I don't know. That's, that's enough of that. <laughs> it works. <laughs> Michelle? Yes. One of the things that I uh, in, uh, see in uh, the movies that came out during that period of time, the one that uh, could be uh, promoted as a feminist movie is uh, Wizard of Oz. You have, uh, especially with the author being a uh, son-in-law of uh, uh, Matilda Gage, and that uh, uh, you have a, a young woman who uh, eventually goes uh, into a, a new uh, land that's, uh, she goes from black and white into a land of diversity, of color, you know, and that she meets a, a whole lot of people and that uh, different people and that uh, she finds along the way uh, uh, male characters who have uh, flaws in their um, selves that she helps them to solve these problems. And um, yeah, I love it. Um, absolutely. That could be read with, I mean, it's, it's fun. It's a fun exercise. The next movie you watch, pay attention. What are the feminists? What are the, the liberating, the empowering messages? Um, you know, what are, what are the, the not so liberating or empowering messages? Um, I love the Wizard of Oz. I definitely watched it every year when it would come on TV. Uh, Sadly, for, for many years, we just had a black and white TV, so that scene didn't really um, have the impact it was supposed to. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, Dorothy is a great example of, um, you know, this, the central character is female. She's going and find on her own adventure where she's, you know, being brave, being active, killing witches. Um, nice. Any other questions? <laughs> okay. We do have another question in chat from Anne. Is there a danger of reading messages into the media that wasn't intended by the creator? Or is it safe to kind of equate commercial appeal with common perceptions and movements? Um, 
as far as sort of that intention of a creator, a pop cultural agent, um, what you create is you can never control how that's going to be perceived by your audience. Um, so even, I mean, even Wonder Woman with Marston, um, there's lots of ways to criticize and point to, um, you know, her skimpy costume, um, her bondage theme. Um, so, he, you know, images are never just, or pop cultural um, products are never just, here's exactly what I'm trying to say. And then now you understand it perfectly as I meant it. Um, so, I don't know whether or not I would consider that dangerous. Um, I think that's just our, our common practice as consumers of popular culture and we need to be better and better at doing it um, so that we can be aware. I think that's the important thing is, um, you know, actually thinking critically about these images um, and what they might be saying and what they might be saying to different people depending on your position in society, your socioeconomic status, your race, your gender, um, you know, all of these things are going to be your experience that you bring and, and make meaning of what you are experiencing. Um, so commercial appeal with common perceptions and movements. Um, the idea that I was getting at with the whole popular culture com commercial appeal, uh, is the shared understanding um, that that one line that I read about um, B. Freeman having eyes that thrill in a figure that's 40. Clearly people back in the twenties knew what that meant. I have no idea. Um, I could hazard guesses, but um, you know, so that, that is a small example of sort of code speak and, and culture a shared understanding. People who know what that means know what that means. Um, and that, so this idea of commercial appeal, trying to communicate to a wide audience, you're going to have to cast a net that is recognizable to that wide audience um, and the various people that you're trying to engage with. Not a question, we have a great comment here from Melissa. I feel like every English class discussion of fiction boils down to exactly that, common perceptions and movements. Yeah. Great. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's, there's certainly other things to unpack, <laughs> but, uh, but that's culture for you. That's shared understanding. Um, if we didn't have that, we wouldn't be able to communicate. Do we have any other questions? Well, if we don't have any other questions, uh, so we'll call it an evening. Thank you so much to Michelle Finn for speaking tonight. Thank That's you for wonderful. having me. You're most welcome. And to have a good night. Thanks everybody, it was good to see you.